Great. Yeah, thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Bing Wang. I'm a research scientist from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab across the Bay. Um, yeah, I hope the order so far has been treating everybody well. I heard it's at the very end of the semester. Hopefully, you um, guys are on track with a lot of things. Uh, one of them I heard is that there's a strong atmosphere of entrepreneurship. So I hope the progress is also you know, going well to 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 be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a joke, but let's take a, a millionaire more seriously <laughs> in the near term. Um, yeah, the topic uh, I would think. Anyway, when did the lab get into the this business of electric vehicles? Can you give us just a date when your lab got into electric vehicles? Well, I think the the date for my lab gets into this business was dated like decades ago, um, even before I joined the lab. Um, there used to be the electric vehicle and grid integration study in terms of V2G, uh, techno-economic analysis, as well as the hardware components. Yeah, the uh, topic, um, mentioned by uh, Ching Wu was about the heavy duty, uh, but I was actually planning to include a little bit more stuff. So I just um, made this topic as integration of EVs in the uh, electric grid systems, um, you know, uh, to include the work uh, for my previous study, like uh, uh, the one in UCLA, uh, how the EVs can be controlled and managed uh, with different kinds of uh, grid conditions. And in this uh, topic in particular, uh, I'm also gonna include another work uh, when I was a postdoc at LBL, like how to aggregate the EVs together as a virtual resources or virtual battery as people uh, you know, are calling it right now. Uh, how can use that as a proxy to integrate and interact with the electric grid? And finally is the heavy load part, uh, which is also an emerging topic uh, in the transportation and electrification area. Um, the key question is how we should and uh, how we can integrate uh, the medium and heavy duty EV into the grid. So those are the topics that I'm gonna um, uh, talk about. And hopefully some of the stuff is old, but I hope it's uh, very interesting, you guys. Um, so the big motivation for EV is that, you know, you can see it is a big thing now and the adoption is accelerating the past one or two years. Um, as you might have heard that, you know, four counties in the state of California has achieved more than 30% market penetration, right? The, maybe the nearest one is the county of San Mateo. Um, uh, at the national scale, there are roughly more than 100 counties with more than 10% market penetration. So EVs everywhere um, is the reality that's happening right now. The National Transportation Decarbonization Blueprint um, published by USDOE also suggests that more than 50% new light duty and more than 30% new medium heavy duty zero emission vehicles will be sold um, starting uh, 2030 to meet the decarbonization goal of the entire transportation sector. If we look at this from the entire sector, it is actually a huge envelope of applications. Not only the on-road light duty vehicle, medium heavy duty vehicle, but also the off-road vehicles, non-road vehicles, such as maritime vessels, aviation, as well as those uh, rail uh, applications. Um, in California, particularly for the medium heavy duty vehicles, we have the advanced clean truck, advanced uh, clean fleet, and the upcoming proposed rule of uh, EPA um, will also promote the adoption of uh, medium heavy duty EVs in this uh, area. However, um, you know, as we are on, if we target 1 billion uh, as the final or, or ultimate goal, and usually the first mile of this journey is very challenging. That's why $1 million you know, is attainable and we have to make it attainable. Um, things are in good shape right now because as you can see, the adoption of EVs at different levels 
are actually making much progress in the past few um, years and months. Um, from the research perspective, I want this topic to help um, students and audience to um, have some insights from those following angles. First is that um, how can we make the EV charging sessions more predictable and manageable, right? If things are happening all over the place and at the different times, uh, things can be chaotic because EVs, in my words, uh, live two lives, one with the grid, one with the transportation. Uh, a lot of times they are characterized as mobile, mobile storage, right? Grab, grabbing energy from the grid and this uh, consume this energy with very complex temporal and geospatial complexities. And the second question is um, how we can operate those chargers in terms of cost effectiveness and the reliability. In reliability, I mean, we have to deliver the energy requested by each EV driver, you know, before the departure time. And finally, um, which is a topic that I've been working on a lot recently, uh, which is to, um, you know, project the charging infrastructure needs for medium and heavy duty vehicles at different, um, you know, geospatial scales in terms of uh, county, state, and the entire nation. And the key, you know, parameters in these equations are the type of chargers, quantity of chargers, and critical locations to deploy those chargers. Um, so those are the high level and the uh, motivation of the talk. Um, then we'll uh, dive into the very first piece of work that I've been doing in this business when I joined UCLA. Um, as a graduate student, we actually built a system as shown on the um, slide. It is a system with a lot of components where you can see EV drivers interact with the system with the mobile apps. They can sub submit their uh, schedule preferences, energy demand, energy request, and this information will be taken by the we call it the EV aggregator in this model, but I don't know if people still call it. Maybe they have a new name for um, virtual power plant or virtual battery for EVs. But the notion is that for this uh, aggregator, we have um, algorithms developed to compute for optimize the schedules and distribute the schedule to individual vehicles. And the EV aggregator is also able to interact with other components in a uh, synthetic uh, microgrid system, like uh, uh, PV generations, energy storages, as well as the underlying building load, but how the EVs can be controlled to achieve the system-wide benefits um, is one of the objectives of the study. In particular, if we look at the user side, right, those are the data uh, we collected from hundreds of uh, real-world EV drivers, we uh, characterize each charging session with a number of uh, parameters, like when the session starts, basically when the EV gets plugged in, right? when the EV leaves, probably you know after school or you know uh, around 5 p.m. for faculty members. And what we try to determine is the actual time the charging session starts and the actual time the energy um, you know got uh, delivered to the vehicle, right? Different users have quite different behaviors. Some of them have very stable start time, right? Some of them, you know, start late, they will stay late. So the duration is more, more stable. But some of them will stick to the, you know, 5 p.m. rule that, you know, it's time to go, now we have to go, right? And there's also similar patterns for the energy demand per charging session versus the duration. The question is, how can we represent these you know, behaviors and these dynamics into some decision models and come up with the reasonable schedules for personalized energy management? That was the uh, research goal uh, in, in, in my study. So we come up with a kernel-based approach, um, giving each data point a Gaussian kernel to represent the behavior. And we add them up to have a probability distribution um, it could be um, multiple dimensions. Um, and for some, some type of users, tuning the bandwidth of the Gaussian kernel um, can get you best uh, personalized estimation in terms of accuracy. And the next thing is 
taking the you know numerical model to represent the user behaviors into this decision process, which follows the rule of model predictive control, right? In each time step, the predictor makes a prediction and feed that estimated value as input to the optimization model. An optimization model computes the conditional optimal solutions and only implement the first element in the series. And this first element is broadcast to the individual um, chargers that got implemented. That's how we um, adaptively um, solve this problem. When the EV, new EV arrives at charging station, the whole timetable will be updated. So the um, so the optimization will be able to take the new information and rerun it and redistribute the control signals. So that's uh, how the system was uh, implemented a long time ago. Um, at that time, reinforcement learning and deep learning techniques were not so popular. So um, I'm actually not sure how powerful this is as of now compared with uh, you know, reinforcement learning, deep learning techniques. But from the result, you can see you know, if we set the cost as a minimization objective, you know, in some low price periods, you know, some charging load got shifted to, to them. When there's a renewable generation, the solar panel on, on, on the rooftop of a building, the EV charging load tries to follow the, you know, solar generation. So as a result, um, the total uh, system-wide cost can be minimized. Also, we can set the total um, flat flatness of the the the, the uh, aggregated net load as an objective. So the idea is to how how can we um, flat the load as much as we can. Um, it can also be achieved uh, by this methodology. Um, here's a, a you know preliminary comparison um of the cost effectiveness in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour delivered to uh, the ev battery and the this method effectively reduced the cost delivered per kilowatt hour and you know this estimate another estimate is based on the outdated information you can see the payback time you know by this lower average operation cost um then um how to take this approach to the next level, right? We are dealing with individual vehicles, individual drivers, but in terms of scalability, when we have more EVs aggregated somewhere, how can we move this orc EV into the power system? How can we operate them in terms of the multiple time periods and in terms of individual vehicles dynamics? So that's the extension of the previous work. And this work, um, you know, is also leveraging the real-world um, EV uh, itinerary information that we collected from a, a location called Alpar in a CEC-funded project. So in that problem scenario, we have a bunch of vehicles, electric vehicles, um, underneath the uh, office buildings with solar panel and you know, um, you know, battery storage, etc. And the idea is that we first aggregate them together based on their schedule constraints and energy demand as a virtual battery, and then uh, participate into a number of different markets, right? For instance, if this thing happens in the utility grade, right? The energy charge will be the first consideration of cost. And some areas, the demand charge is also a big thing, a big factor. But in California, particularly in this study, we consider the PG&E territory. There are a number of other incentives that we can bring onto the table. For instance, the you know something called uh, ancillary service market, proxy demand resource market, time of uh, the peak day pricing and demand bid programs. Each program has a quite specialized rule for resources to be able to join the market in the first place. And if they join the market, they have to comply with the rule, for instance, stay in the market for a period of time. So they, all these constraints are very complex to model. We um, spend a, a lot of efforts just to make sure um, the comprehensive formulation covers all these cost factors and these constraints can be properly uh, represented. It turned out that this, the, this ended as a very uh, giant mixed integer programming problem. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, so you know the complexity. Um, we leverage some uh, solvers uh, that's uh, pretty efficient uh, solving the problem on behalf of the aggregator. Um, so this is how the aggregator looks like um, based on some of the uh, previous study. Um, this, for instance, the, uh, the number of EVs, you know, we want to use the uh, Apple energy bonds versus lower energy bonds to characterize this um, EV battery. The uh, blue curve is the scenario where all the EVs charge as soon as they can, as soon as they arrive at the location. So this is a fastest run, ramping up curve, right? And the red curve is the, for each EV to uh, start charging as late as they can, as long as they can get the energy before the departure. So the optimization objective is to find the optimal trajectory in between, eventually to reach the you know uh, total energy state for the whole EV group. Um, so the the problem turns out to be solvable. Um, we can see um, you know pretty significant cost savings or revenue revenue generations by considering these market opportunities and. We also uh, tested some different um, sensitivity, uh, so some different knobs. For instance, the threshold to participate in the market. Uh, for instance, you have to have certain amount of resource that you can commit to join the market, right? If I have a phone battery with like five watts, that's too small. But I have a number of EVs with like a 500 mag uh, kilowatt power that I can commit for certain periods, then I'm eligible to participate in those programs. So those are uh, modeled and the revenue are uh, you know, summarized here. Um, another big factor we find is the flexibility. And this flexibility is uh, in terms of time flexibility. That means um, if I can park there for a number of hours and you know the maximum, the fastest charging can only take like you know 20% of the parking duration. That means I have a lot of flexibility to shift my charging to other time periods or change my charging power to achieve different objectives, right? So we tested different uh, flexibility um, threshold to see how, um, you know, how, how the uh, cost performance looks like. So these are uh, the results. You can see that more flexibility, more lucrative, <laughs> but it's not the, you know, uh, to some level, it will stop increasing because there's a threshold of the you know uh, total energy needs by that vehicle as a constraint. Um, this part is uh, addition to this work because so far we have been talking about at the things at the aggregator level. But once the aggregator has the energy commitment, how can the aggregator disaggregate it and distribute the energy to individual vehicles? And in reality, as we, you know, uh, had a lot of experience uh, in the real world settings, you know, for instance, the communication is not very robust. We lost data packet, and some of the EV drive, some one of the EVs failed to communicate. There's a data packet loss, something like that. How can we make the decentralized the optimizing or decision making more robust uh, in the context of the, you know, market uh, opportunities, right? So in this case, we develop a synchronized, um, decentralized EV charging algorithm. You know, each EV call communicate with this aggregator while solving its local optimization problem. Um, this is based on the ADMM um, methodology. However, uh, by tuning the step size and the you know uh, search direction for each EV, it is possible to come up with a robust solution if some of the EV are offline for certain periods, that's still um, the, the convergence to the global optimality is still achievable in this case. Um, if you are interested, uh, um, feel free to take a close look. And um, it's still, um, in my opinion, has a lot of realistic meaning in the EV implementation if we are really seeking the optimality uh, of the whole system. Um, then fast switching from the individual EV control, EV aggregator control, decentralized control to the next topic, which is the you know electrifying 
the medium and the heavy duty vehicles. So this the work that I have been uh, focusing on for um, the recent years. Um, the big motivation is that uh, ACT, ACF, and the EPA rules are projecting a lot of medium heavy duty EVs on the road in the future. And LBL, um, my team, was tasked by uh, California Energy Commission for their Assembly of Bill 2127 assessment. So this work um, was focusing on the projection of infrastructure needs in terms of the quantity, type, and location of those charges for, for the future electric trucks, including buses. Um, here is the snapshot of the you know, uh, adoption. Um, it looks like based on AAT3 scenario, which is uh, um, you know some uh, remodeling of the ACT ACF rules uh, on top of the cap cap data, and we are focusing on the vehicles with more uh, with gross vehicle weight more than ten thousand pounds, and these vehicles um, have a wide range of applications. For instance, the dredge long haul trucks. Right, and also the regional uh, vocational vehicles, as well as the transit buses. Um, there does not exist uh, such model that comprehensively, you know, model the universal medium heavy duty at the time when we are doing this work. And I will show uh, in the next slide that how this process is carried out. Uh, maybe you have been a little bit familiar with this process in some other occasions. But I want to emphasize that this workflow um, really starts from some key inputs as the most important one. I'm sorry. That's the technology. <laughs> yeah, and the most important one is the travel demand model. It's a prob probabilistic model telling us how many trips are coming from one part on the map as or trip origins to other parts of the destination. So it's a probabilistic model um, that we can synthesize the trip distributions based on how many vehicles we are considered in the system. And the second thing is the uh, uh, truck GPS location data, which includes the trip start time, trip duration, trip distance, all these statistics that are coming from the real world. The synthesize the travel demand and trip volume, we have to make them share the same statistical pattern as the real world data. That's uh, one of the motivations there. Uh, adoption piece is very important. Um, this is super interesting to the policy makers. In different scenarios, there are different composition, compositions of vehicle types in the scenario. There's also a different uh, vehicle volume uh, the vehicle stock uh, at different year. So all these parameters should be synchronized and the synthesized should be harmonized with the travel demand model too. Um, then the next part is uh, agent-based simulation, uh, which is the core of the heavy load tool, which takes the travel demand model at the trip level and resolve the integrated uh, activities, like how the vehicle drives, parks, charges, and routes itself, if you know, if the vehicle finds the energy very low in the battery that and it cannot support the full trip, right? The vehicle is has to do its own decision to find the optimal or nearest or shortest distance, shortest travel time location in its original route. So we are trying to mimic how the you know truck driver drivers do in the reality. As a result, you can see the truck. We, you know, the, the charging demand and the infrastructure needs can be quantified at different geospatial scales in terms, for instance, uh, at the county level, at the uh, traffic analysis zone level, zone level, or we can also quantify um, the charging events at the location level. By location, I'm, for instance, uh, this example shows the truck stops um, we found in the state of California. Um, if the truck stop is really in a popular area, it can be selected by a lot of trips as a waypoint. So it's a natural um, instinct that a lot of trucks can stop by here with some energy demand. It's a, also an indication that you know infrastructure can be needed in this location to support the charging demand. 
And the next thing we did is through uh, CEC's edge tool um, by adding the simulated charging demand, charging load on top of the circuit base load and compare the new load profile versus the circuit capacity that aged data uh, can cover. Uh, the hope is that uh, the comparison can be very informative to the utility companies saying, okay, in this area, there's a huge transportation uh, charging demand, but your circuit capacity is not enough to support the demand. And it's a good indicator for the infrastructure theory. So connection requests or transformer or feeder upgrade, et cetera. Um, Here's a snapshot of those, uh, you know, uh, vocations and the GPS data represent in, in, in the model. Um, we really appreciate the data set from UC Riverside and West Virginia University that we leverage to characterize the uh, applications um, and vocations in the model. Um, it's a, a little bit more explanation of the uh, charger selection algorithm that I just mentioned. Um, given the origin and destination of our trip, um, there's an assumption that you know there could be a depot chargers needed at both ends of the trip, because we assume you know it's either loading, unloading, or parking at the public uh, locate warehouse or distribution centers, or it returns to the depot at the end of the trip. So the depot chargers are needed at those places. However, when the vehicles are on the road, uh, each road segment uh, will allow these vehicles to evaluate their situations by looking at the energy state of charge. Say, okay, if the energy state of charge is uh, below a certain threshold, so a threshold, right? It's reasonable for us to look for the, you know, best chargers along the way so that we can, you know, uh, still finish the trip but avoid the range anxiety. Um, this is a, a simplistic way to, uh, to do the charger selection for trip-based travel demand model. But in the current practice, um, the data we received from our partner has more granularities. Not only one trip to represent one vehicle, we can actually rep represent one vehicle with multiple trips over multiple days. It's more closer. It's closer to the reality because vehicles make multiple trips, multiple stops during the day, and the decision making about which stop to charge, and which stop to assign chargers, is getting more challenging. So a lot of criteria such as the number of stops per location, the uh, uh, duration of stop, and the arrival time of those trips at these locations are considered to to characterize these locations. Um, this is an ongoing work, um, but um, this, that those are our mindset to um, further uh, refine the uh, location-based energy analysis. Uh, we got the opportunity to extend the California work for the Assembly Bill 2027 report to the national scale uh, analysis. This work is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy Vehicle Technology Office. Um, you can see the process is very similar, but the scalability is huge. <laughs> um, if you take a look at the travel demand model, it covers the entire nation. And we took a national scale um, scenario as an input to tell us how many um, vehicle stocks for different vehicle, uh, vehicle types. And we you know, cross-validate it with the, uh, you know, the uh, truck OD data from um, National Renewable Energy Lab, and also the vehicle registration data so that we can you know, um, calibrate the volume of trips starting from one particular location to other locations. And at the state level, the statistics still match the, those from the, uh, from, from the adoption scenario. In the simulation, each one of these OD is routed and the routes are computed in terms of shortest the travel time, shortest the distance. And if you can, uh, you know, if you can see the green versus uh, uh, red routes, um, those are two different kinds of routes we consider. Um, one, uh, maybe the, the, this is an example for the New York 
maybe the red one is the uh, uh, depot uh, based routes which starts directly start from the state of New York and and also or, or uh, they ended at the state of New York but the green one is more complex um, it doesn't start from from the state or it doesn't end but it just passed through the state that doesn't um, you know Th that was not counted as the default charging trip, but it shows some opportunity for the public in route charging, right? If it, it, it is a common scenario that um, for the state, which is a popular location for trips to stop by, even though they are not originated from them, but you have a lot of, you know, carried over emissions and uh, energy demand in your territory. But, so that's the dynamics we want to, uh, you know, capture in this model. As a result, we can also uh, project the load at the county level and also the infrastructure needs uh, in terms of default chargers versus public chargers. Um, if, uh, I don't know if this is visible, but uh, the public charger demand over counties uh, align pretty well with the uh, freight corridors, um, which, is, uh, which makes sense, right? Um, and also we can uh, quantify the truck volume over road segments as a, another uh, byproduct, byproduct of the simulation. Just trying to make the uh, make it more fun <laughs> by bringing some cartoons. Uh, those are the activities being simulated. Um, it's just the moving uh, vehicles uh, where they are at different time of the day. It was not perfect, uh, but it shows you know, different types of vehicles got how, how they got modeled. Um, this one is the charging uh, depot charging load um, at different time of the day. As a result, so you can see some concentrations in those hot areas. Um, but another layer actually um, is um, the intensity of, of the load at different locations that was not not uh, visualized here. Um, similar scenarios, but slightly different um, assumptions uh, are made for the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, one key distinct, distinction is that we don't assume depot refueling, location, refueling infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So more energy was shifted towards the public infrastructure. Um, this is the animation of the simulated the refueling demand um, of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles um, aggregated over those uh, truck um, uh, stops. Um, interestingly, you can see the magnitude, relative magnitude of demand at different locations. And also you can see how the demand slowly uh, shifted from the East Coast to, to the West Coast. Um, yeah. Uh, with the model, um, we the, the 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 goal for us is to provide a tool uh, to, to test drive different scenarios. As you can, um, you know, see a lot of parameters, a lot of um, key assumptions, um, you know, are quite different depending on who the decision makers are, right? So we want to make it as a convenient platform for users to test drive different scenarios and assumptions. So um, here's an example that if we, um, in this result, if we compare the load, um, you know, load shape at different uh, location scales, for instance, the first one is uh, at the entire na uh, national scale. And then if we zoom into the state of California and zoom into the, you know, county of San Bernardino, the load shapes are different. And also the smoothness of those load curves are different. And the, the more granular the geospatial scales got, um, the spikiness, the more spikiness we will observe, right? Because in this scenario, we consider not only different applications and also the supply of different type of chargers with the maximum charging power up to uh, one megawatt. One megawatt, you know, in, in some locations, is uh, like energy uh, load of, uh, you know, neighborhood or it's 100 households. Because if you can imagine the turn on and off of this 100 households in your neighborhood, that's a huge impact to the grid. 
Um, so through this um, you know, tool, we can see the composition of the load contribution from these chargers and how sensitive this load can be if we switch the low power charger to the high power charger. That's we, what we want, um, what capability we want to enable the decision makers. Uh, the next uh, example analysis is on the state of charge. Um, in the simulation, it's also a knob for us to turn like um, how much SOC, how much percentage of energy left in the battery when the vehicle starts their trip, right? If we assume, you know, these, the vehicle start, start the SOC is randomly distributed, or it's more elevated to close to the level close to 100%, right? Which, it, you know, by some assumption, it is true, right? The early adopters of the medium heavy duty EVs start their trip from depot with overnight charging. So the SOC is, could be relatively high, close to 100%, right? But in some cases, if it's not that case, if the SOC is randomly distributed, how the charging demand will change. How you know how it will change in terms of the public the public charging demand versus the depot charging demand? So this actually gives us some kind of uh, some uh, insight. For instance, um, if we assume there's a high SOC compared with the base SOC, you know the curve, the public charging curve got shifted a little bit uh, afterwards during the day. But if we assume a randomly assumed you can see more aggressively people want to get the public charging because more vehicles you know um they drop the energy soc levels below the threshold as the starting soc is relatively low than the previous right so you can see the the ratio between um people energy in total versus the public energy in total and also the shape of the energy demand for different type of loads this will give um, the utility companies hopefully a lot of insights on when um, they should manage their distribution assets given the demand at different time. There's just two examples. So a lot of work are still um, you know, in the process. We're testing every possible knob we can, and we're still validating with our um, uh, collaborators in this regard. So please stay tuned uh, for and we we'll, and we'll definitely welcome uh, any future collaboration or insights into this, because this is really a new uh, area for us to take baby steps on. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> it's pretty much um, uh, to the end of my uh, discussion, but this is the most exciting part usually for me to talk about the future um, directions. Um, the one that's most interesting to me is uh, autonomous load management. There's a lot of um, multiple dimensions in this question. First is, as we discussed, you know, we have been considering the temporal flexibility of EVs, aggregators, but how about the geospatial flexibility, right? If some locations have higher or more available circuit capacities for the EV charging, maybe it's an opportunity to shift the load over to our EV that way, right, to take, take advantage of the capacity so you can defer the billion dollar infrastructure upgrade request, right? Um, so there's something we call the circuit capacity, both temporally and uh, geospatially. And the other um, angle, as I was just uh, chatting this with uh, our colleagues the other day, that if there is an option for every EV, to do manage charging with one button, as a do smart charging. Now, the EVs in the future will be turned as an energy trading robot, very similar to the you know stock market nowadays, because the majority of the transactions are made by algorithms and robots, right? How do we trust those robots playing against each other, playing against the system? So that's a really interesting um, area for us to look. How can we? Um, develop market mechanism, develop control algorithm that regulates the EV, uh, EV charging behaviors so that the overall system performance can be achieved, but also the energy delivery to individual vehicles can also be uh, satisfied. Um, the next one is on the infrastructure side. 
um, you know, even though right right now we can determine the you know initially the uh, type quantity and location of chargers, but how can we do it optimally? Right? What are the best locations? Should we or least regret locations we should consider for the initial phase? Um, this makes me I think that's very similar to the real estate business, right? Starting from the key locations, but how can we identify them in the first place? Right. If some locations are identified, how can we assign the right number of chargers and right type of charger in those locations so that optimally the system evolves in a way that's both cost effective to the public and the government, but also it's reliable. It's it, it's if they can meet the charging demand, covers most of the trips charging demand, right? And there's also the battery electric and uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cell EV considerations that we have to consider. This work is ongoing too. Um, hopefully, um, we'll have more results to share in the near future. Um, the next one is also from my recent discussion with colleagues that, you know, as I mentioned, there's so many different knobs in the scenario, in one scenario, but policymakers and the public are in, more interested in more scenarios. How things will look if I turn one of the knobs, right? how the system performs differently, how the results will look differently. Um, you know, running one simulation using the high performance computer is quite expensive, but how can we leverage the existing runs, existing simulations, and all the existing simulator as a trainer or expert and extrapolate to the scenarios that have not been, you know, comprehensively evaluated. Can the generative AI be used for large language model? I'm just randomly <laughs> thinking uh, bendy directions in, um, as you know, uh, a natural extension of this capability. Okay. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, people have been talking a lot about the non-road and off-road electrification. Each one of these uh, um, applications needs dedicated uh, considerations in terms of duty cycle, feasibility, uh, cost effectiveness, et cetera. So um, in terms of research and uh, um, you know, modeling, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I don't want to um, discourage people, but this uh, we, we have um, you know, make a serious first step towards achieving the first one million go. <laughs> um, I heard that first. First part is very, very, uh, very challenging, but later, economy scale. So uh, that's pretty much uh, what I have. Um, uh, I, I think uh, first, thank, thank, thank you for having me here, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, communicate with uh, you know our faculty and uh, and students. Yeah, let me know if there are any uh, questions can help.